I'd like to now introduce our keynote speaker. Paul Mahaldas is an Associate Professor of Civic Media and Journalism in the School of Communication at Emerson College in Boston. Paul is a leading world expert on the topic of media literacy and civic media, and he's written many books on this topic, and this is his most recent one, um, Civic Media Literacies, and uh, it's, it's excellent, and I'm sure he'll be talking about it today. While Paul is recognised as a leading scholar in this area, he's also contributed as a practitioner to many successful civic media initiatives in the United States and beyond. As director of the Salzburg Academy on Media and Global Change, Paul oversees a highly successful program that annually gathers over 60 students and a dozen faculty members from around the world to work together to collaborate to create media literacy projects um, that are now used in more than 100 countries. In 2020, as a response to COVID, the Academy moved fully online for the first time and it focused on the two greatest issues we were all in the midst of grappling with protests and the pandemic. Please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Paul Mahaldas. Thanks everybody and Tanya thanks for that wonderful introduction and um, uh, is okay you can see the screen okay and good to go? Okay great. Good to go it's all great. Thanks so um, <clears throat> I, I appreciate the kind introduction and it's it's wonderful to be with everyone. I, I first want to just take a, a second to thank Tanya and Michael and Sora and their team for inviting me to participate and to share with you today some ideas and some recent research uh, I've been doing. It's been a, I think it will be a real treat for this group. Uh, also, Sherry and Michelle to have you here that have been supporting and leading this research, collaborative research effort. So I've had the chance to to learn and listen about the work being done in Australia. And I imagine even this kind of pre full findings um, symposium today uh, is sure to bring excitement to what the potential is for media literacy um, at the scale that, that Michael and Sora and Tanya are researching. So I'm really, um, I'm just really supportive of their work and, and hope that, that, uh, that this day is meaningful for everyone. My job um, today, is I think to offer a provocation to share some work with you. Um, uh, as much as I also wish I could be there, um, I also think I'm. this is a first success for me. So it's I'm in Boston, Massachusetts right now where um, I've managed to have a full day of work and coach a youth soccer team and have dinner and help put the children to bed and then hop online to be with everybody to start your day. So uh, that's a, it's new for me, but I'm really happy to, to, be, um, to be able to do it. So. Uh, this, this talk is, uh, as the title um, shows here, Civic Media Literacies, um, and the subtitle for today is Pursuing Equitable and Just Civic Futures in a Time of Rampant Media Cynicism. As Tanya um, just mentioned, uh, recently published a uh, text of mine, um, which I'll be using today to talk, to talk with, with you and uh, hopefully to engage in some dialogue as well. <clears throat> a few notes about this work just to ground you in, in what I'll be sharing with you. So number one is uh, the, the research that grounded this book while um, it, it talked to folks in different way, it has, what I'll be speaking about today is coming from the perspective of our experiences here in the United States. And uh, what I hope um, you'll hear will translate and have some relevance for you. Uh, the work I'm doing here uh, was with um, young people who are not at primary levels of education, but transitioning into secondary levels and also into higher and post-secondary um, formal education or informal education and work lives. So we're really looking at that intersection between young people media and civic participation. I do think the work here can scale into different various elements, but I do hope those, those are relevant. So now that that's out of the way, um, what I'd like to do is just start with the story of where this research began. Uh, as someone who teaches and uses a lot of design methodology and runs an entire graduate program in media design here at Emerson College, um, I'm, of the, I'm of the opinion as a researcher that um, we must identify the problems if we are 
figuring out how to respond to those problems in meaningful ways. And that's part of the research journey and also the design journey. So this story starts back, I'd say four or five years now, when um, we had the underpinnings of various social platforms and, and technological norms uh, that were combining with heightened political um, polarization in the United States to cause a, you know, what we would call a, a phenomenon of narratives of fake news and distrust in media and so on and so forth. And what we what we were seeing as this really rampant media cynicism here in the United States. And what we noticed as our research team was, and I was talking to many news outlets at the time and and um, all, all asking like, is media literacy the answer to the current state that we see? We see a lot of spectacle and sensationalism. We see fake news growing. We see technological platforms. We see political interference with media uh, in, our, in our civic systems. Um, if people were more media literate, we might be able to solve this. So we have all this frenzy of like, how do we think about media literacy as a solution to this problem? Uh, and for me, it really, it really kind of set off a journey and ended up in that textbook, but and still a continuing journey to identify um, what are the social conditions, what are the political conditions, what are the human conditions that are at play here that are um, allowing us to come to this moment that media literacy can serve right, that, that can serve appropriately as a response to our time and not be looked at as a simple solution to simply if we teach people more, they'll become more media literate. Um, so as I started talking, I realized that through my research in media literacy, I'd always had these kind of a set of constraints that we always worked around. Uh, the first one is that media literacy interventions can, can um, it's, it's largely the case in the United States, but I, I imagine elsewhere and elsewhere in the world where I have worked, um, it cannot match the pace of technological innovation. Uh, this is something we see again and again, is that by the time our, our formal educators and our librarians and our community centers are, are, are grappling with the new technologies and platforms and algorithms and designs on media, um, what lessons are appropriate, the newer, newest technology and wave of information norms, not, not just modalities, but the norms with which people use information evolve. Um, the second one is that media literacy practices in the United States oftentimes are prioritizing individual responsibility. And what we noticed in the last four or five years is we're partly having an individual problem with media and information norms in the United States, but it seems like it's more a problem that's communal driven or peer driven in these online spaces where there's a lot of that kind of social capital happening within these polarized spaces. And the third side is that we've noticed here in the United States, and this may be different in Australia and elsewhere, but uh, media literacies often uh, have the potential to exacerbate or reify the social and civic inequities, not only with inequities in, in race and gender and ethnicity here in the United States, but also simply um, inequities in socioeconomic status and the availability of media literacies to be um, to, to be provided to populations that are marginalized or in need. So we noticed that these were three constraints that um, were making it hard to see media literacy as a response. But as um, as I was going through this, I was reading this book, and it's where I want to launch what what we see as the two main phenomena that are at play um, that I think we need to interrogate or at least come into connection with as we think about how media literacy can be prioritized today. And in, in, in my hope for this, your day uh, in this symposium is that I can offer some provocations to help you think through the rest of your work and your dialogue as you go forward. And this one quote, um, it stuck with me after I read this book by Michael Bugeja, um, it, uh, published an updated edition um, a few years back and called Interpersonal Divide in the Age of the Machine. And he had a longer quote, but what stuck at me is saying, we struggle with the rigors of the human condition. In an age of ubiquitous media, we struggle with the rigors of the human condition. And it actually struck me as if, what are these struggles and what role has media and the norms with which we use and think about media from when we're young through adulthood what are what is the relationship with media and these and the rigors of the human condition that we are struggling with now? Professor Bugeja had a quite an extensive look at at some of these ideas, and it's a wonderful text. And we went back and researched for a year or two, 
And uh, what's outlined in the in the book, uh, there are two phenomena that I want to share with everybody today. Um, and interrogate these a little bit before we get to thinking through how media literacy might approach us in this time. And these two are spectacle and distrust. And I'm gonna take a few minutes to go through each of these and um, talk about why I think it's important that we understand the conditions for spectacle and distrust within our current digital cultures. Uh, again, I also understand and want to acknowledge as I talk about this that um, you know, there are there are assumptions being made when we think about this in terms of access and engagement with digital culture that might not be true in all communities, especially if we look at different parts of the world. For the sake of this book, these were the norms we, within we were within which we were working. Um, but I, I do want to acknowledge that they're not the ubiquitous norms that that deal with every community. Um, but I'll start with spectacle. Uh, now, this <laughs> this colorful slide is um, not the most sophisticated. But I, I think it's it's quite important for us to take a minute and pause. And um, at least in the United States, and I know that the context is quite different in Australia and you're going through something very recent um, in the political realm, which I don't, don't feel confident to speak about with some of these platforms and negotiating regulations and, and news flow in them. Uh, I will say here in the United States that research has shown us that over the, you know, the past five or six years since we started looking into this and thinking about these tools in the context of the human condition. Um, they are based and largely premised on a set of values. And this set of values are no longer in line with the civic values or the democratic values that we, that, that we, that we I think, generally assume are necessary for equitable and just um, uh, just daily life to, to happen, right? That we need strong and robust media infrastructures. And as much as these tools connect us, uh, I think it's become um, quite clear in the context of the United States that these tools, uh, they value um, continued time on over complex and nuanced dialogue, that they use in them over time is proven to exacerbate misinformation, it's proven to end up in more polarizing and perhaps extreme information spaces. And it's, and it's now shown to, um, to produce homophily, where we are siloed with like-minded views in ways that reaffirm them through peer trust and reciprocity uh, to no longer need to focus on credibility. So I think the norms of these tools, as they ask us to be forever and ever engaged, uh, it's it's now come to in our country to a turning point where the opportunity of them, I don't want to dismiss them outright. They're very strong tools for personal engagement, for entertainment, and perhaps even for advocacy and fundraising. But if they're applied into this civic space, and if we look at media literacy within these spaces, um, we don't acknowledge. Probably too late to acknowledge that we should just abandon them, but. I don't know if there's enough criticality with the intention of these tools to create a culture of spectacle and normalize that. Now, news outlets have forcefully come into these spaces because that's where the audiences are. We can argue that print, we can argue that those decisions as much as we want, but we understand that they have opted in to these spaces. And when they opt into these, our politicians, what we've considered our mainstream media outlets, they opt into the values that these tools promote. And it's not the other way around. So um, the result of this, if we take a few examples to look at how spectacle has worked. Um, the first one here is in the United States. Uh, I was reading this as recently as today about, um, I actually received my first vaccine dose uh, this afternoon in accordance with the guidelines of the state of Massachusetts, uh, that we have upwards of perhaps a third of the United States that, that would refuse the vaccine at this point. And we have vaccine surpluses in some states and deficiencies in others. Now, um, what's really interesting about this is if we take an example like this and place it into, uh, this is a, a great piece of research done last year by First Draft. Um, uh, and they, they were looking at vaccine discourse on social media uh, and they were looking at across these narratives. Um, you can see political and economic motives, safety, efficacy, and necessity, conspiracy theories, liberties, and freedoms. Uh, and then here they were looking at how many posts they analyzed, what languages they were sent in, and then some of the examples of how these posts were working in deep internet subcultures to actually 
um, bring up doubt about these the vaccines. Now, um, of course, there's there's a whole bunch of different science and research going on 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 trust around these vaccines and where that comes from. But we do know that once they're placed into these internet subcultures through media platforms, um, there's as much weight put behind some of these conspiracy theories and different political and economic motives producing disinformation um, as there is to try to promote real information. Now, we, we don't simply blame the platforms in this, but the way that users use this and how they share it matters, right? And if the platforms are prioritizing pe people to stay on these with each other, finding information they like, then we see what happens here with, with an exacerbation of this type of information. Um, the second, I think, example of spectacle that might be helpful here is something that we call the, the principle of layers, which was um, something that a Penn State professor has been working on, uh, looking at online news and, and kind of source credibility. And he talks about, um, you know, we write people care more about information that confirms their values than that which is accurate. Uh, and what's interesting in this principle of layers is that, you know, Oftentimes we think about media literacy as needing to, you know, sourcing and credibility of information. And I, and I agree with that 100% is a really big issue with online information. How do we understand and credibility? And um, what this research finds is, and then, and then I'll explain the green frog, which I think most of you know by now, um, without being able to see the audience and just a green frog on my screen. It's, um, yeah, it's a good way to speak. What he finds is um, that in these online spaces where we now know, at least in the United States, again, as we show, a majority of citizens are migrating into these online spaces and social platforms for news and civic information and to engage in dialogue and, um, and interactions around um, you know, new political and civic life. Um, that the source of that information is now layered. It's layered behind the social platform. It's layered behind the information and who sent that information, and then another link, and then potentially even another one. And when you're in those platforms where they're not designed to have you slow down and continue to engage in that deconstruction, it's quite harder for us to go into these credible spaces. So therefore, what we might do is with strongly designed um, campaigns or misinformation articulations in our culture, that connect with human condition around wanting information that's more spectacular and sensationalized, that we're, we are much safer to feel that it's validated through peer likes or people that we know advocating for it as well. So in the United States, you can take this farther and farther down the path of distrusting an entire political and media infrastructure, right? So the classic example of this, which we highlight in the text is that of Pepe the Frog. And there's a brand new documentary about this case called Feels Good Man. Uh, and it just came out this winter um, uh, here in the United States. Uh, and it's worth a watch. It's quite, it's quite difficult to watch, um, but it, it, it shows the evolution of, a, of an internet, kind of a, an internet subculture magazine about a stoner frog named Pepe as kind of a, you know, just a cultural figure who is very popular, get appropriated by um, politicians and, um, and specific hate groups in the alt-right. And then through internet subcultures and continuing spreading actually had more of an imprint uh, at the time of this 2016 political election used by politicians. All the pictures here were actually sent out through social media by the political campaign of our former president uh, and established as in some measures having more impact than regular news, right? And you could argue that this is just silly fun, but I would also argue um, that, there's a, that there's a case to be made that, that these have as much resonant value, right? And then the last thing on spectacle I'll say is, at least in the United States, a Pew Research Report in 2019 shows that, um, I think one of the cause of these, of these platforms and their centrality in our media life is that uh, they are, that, that idea of trust and erosion is that um, what people think drives the news judgment is not, um, factuality or credibility or sourcing, but if the perception is how many people pay attention to it and are affected by it. Um, perceptions of news media's role in society uh, has switched, are not professional, uh, hurt democracy, are too critical of their own country and don't care about the people they report on. These trends 
are set in stage by social platforms that prioritize spectacular information. And then the second half of this, which is distrust, right? And so going back to that beginning, like the, the idea that if we are you know, very concerned as, as I am about what are the media literacy interventions that we need in our formal and informal spaces of education uh, to actually create more equitable and just societies, to provide people with the mindsets and the, and the dispositions to be able to navigate and effectively participate in their communities. I want us to really think about that, the societal pro or the norms that are guiding our interactions and not simply the idea that we, we need to get more lesson plans into one place, but we need to understand what the interventions are responding to. And so the second argument in this book is that of distrust. And uh, I'll talk about this um, quickly to get into the, the, the media literacy part and have time for discussion. So uh, we know there's various studies and I'm using just a simple profile here that shows that trust <clears throat> globally in our major public institutions has declined um, steadily in the past you know, 2016 to 2017 and the numbers are, are no better now. There's not really kind of bounce back at least in the United States numbers that I've seen more recent. But uh, what's interesting here is um, of the public institutions, it's, it's media that has suffered the, the largest fall in trust. And, and I think there are some structural ways that I wanna think about this and, um, and then some also kind of intentional ways. And again, uh, I, this is not, I will get back to the solution here. I don't wanna be all doom and gloom, but I do think it's important for us to understand the problems for us. So structural, at least in the United States, is this idea of like uh, the gutting of local news. So one really interesting study is um, in 2019, there was a, a, a survey done that said less people in 2019 than since I think it was Pew had been doing this work had ever had actually met a journalist than in any other point past or, or met a media professional that at any point in the past since the data was starting to be collected. So that removal from the media institutions that we serve obviously impacts our trust in those media institutions. At the same time, um, the, the prowess of these social platforms and here in the United States, they, you know, they are, you know, they are quite monopolistic or oligopolistic, however you might want to look at it. Uh, but they've done a, a, a quite a number on the local news outlets. And I would also add in that the largest mainstream news outlets and media outlets in the United States are as much to blame, in my opinion, for using the similar tactics. Uh, organizations like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, very sophisticated in how they enter into local communities and try to take those eyeballs away to fund their bottom line. So it might be a little bit different from where you are, but the result is that when we don't have local news ecosystems to help provide us takes and important information to bind communities, we end up going to these larger social platforms which remove us from the connections that we might need to have trust in our healthy societies. Um, you know, I'll just, just because of the research we were looking at, this is also a problem in Brazil. It's, it's something that I don't, and I don't know how it is in Australia, but it's increasingly a problem in different parts of the world. Um, on top of the news desert problem, is uh, this is a recent, a, a really interesting study that was just done by the, the Toast Town Center at Columbia University in New York, um, showing that not only do we have news deserts, but where you have less local news, you have these really sophisticated hyper-partisan sites that actually masquerade as local news sites. And when you go to these sites, it's actually quite fascinating. They do a lot of research to embed themselves in local community. And um, they're filling a void that they notice and they're, um, they're working on specific political issues and whoever's starting them and, and doing them is, is quite, becomes quite nuanced in the lay of those communities, who their populations are, which way they lean on certain issues. And then they actually just masquerade them as local news sites. And they're not really regulated here. So this is also a huge problem in how we trust in our institutions and media institutions, right? Um, we know this is an MIT study that was done in 2018 uh, that looked at uh, 50 million tweets for those of you who saw it. And um, it's a fascinating study. And there was a, a great article in the Atlantic, I think a year or two ago about the study, but also the reports available online. Um, and uh, they, they, across all the metrics of the variables that they analyzed, found out that by, by every common metric, falsehood consistently dominates the truth on, on Twitter. And this was 
the metrics of um, how long the tweets stay as um, resonant, how much they spread, how much they get shared. And it's a similar, it's, it's not, you know, it's the same as the YouTube study that was done in 2018 here by uh, Zainab Tufeki of North Carolina that showed the longer that you stay in a political space in YouTube, the more extreme the recommended videos come, right? So this is a very similar phenomenon. Um, for my sake, thinking about the human condition, again, the, the rigor, the struggle of the rigors of the human condition that needs that nuance and that complexity. But when we're continually sated with the, the information guided by our peers with little regard for the markers for trust and truth, how do we solve that? And the last thing I'll say on distrust before we get to the media literacy angle here um, is, and excuse the language, is, is uh, there's a great, treatment that I actually just wanted to share with you all if you're interested in a quick read uh, by a, a public philosopher, Harry Frankfurt, written in the 80s, but has been revived at least here uh, as a way that we think about. He wrote it on, on bullshit. And there's really one in our work when we were kind of thinking about distrust. And there was a lot of this, a lot in our media literacy fields were saying, well, the fake news, they're just lying. It, they're just not telling the truth. And we need to re revisit truth. And, you know, it's actually really interesting to differentiate what he calls bullshit versus lying. So he, he writes, and I'll just read this quickly. Bullshit is speech intended to persuade without regard for truth. The liar cares about the truth and attempts to hide it. The bullshitter doesn't care if what they say is true or false, but rather only cares whether the listener is persuaded. And I think it's really important um, to differentiate the intentional lie who's, who's um, caring about the truth and attempting to hide or subvert that, whereas the bullshitter just calls everything into question, which is more of what we see in these fake news spaces. Um, uh, and it's not all bullshit, but it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting way in which we come to think about distrust in our societies, right? And so the result of these two problems, what I think are these two kind of emerging norms of digital culture, at least in the context of our research in the United States, spectacle and distrust, they emerge in something we call agency gaps. And I'm going to, uh, as we transition into the media literacy phase for the last uh, portion of my talk, I'm gonna play a short video. Um, uh, it's actually just a short time lapse. And it's done by a doctoral student uh, some years ago now, probably four or five years ago, and I still think it's very relevant, um, who actually used GDELT data. So it's kind of a global database um, the graduate student mapped every time there was a protest that was covered in the news, um, both in the mainstream news and then later in like social media, like online news sites that were considered mainstream. And he created like a map of the globe with dots heating up. If you've seen it, um, you can bear with me again, it's a few minutes, but I wanna show you that as an example of the result of societies that are using these technologies that have normalized spectacle and distrust. And what we call them is emergent agency gaps between articulating concern and the capacity to act. And I think this is really important for media literacy work and what you'll engage in today. And so um, I'll show you this. It's a very quick um, 90 second uh, clip here. And I, I hope you can all see that okay on your screens. Um, if you can, you'll see that these, all the little heat dots, they correspond with protests on the planet from 1979 to 2013. Uh, and the, the doctoral student who did this work um, is part of there at, at Penn State University. And if you look here at the bottom, you'll see the year. You can see we get into the late eighties. You can see where there's some protests and, and you can see Europe. And obviously there's a lot going on in 1989 and the early nineties around, um, you know, in Germany and, and other places. Uh, you can see there's a, probably a dearth of news coverage where there's a lot of protests going on. As we get into the mid nineties and late nineties, I, I want us to kind of really consider when we think about um, what cultures do that, uh, that normalize spectacle and distrust along with giving everyone platforms to articulate their concern about things. So in 2000, 2001, you have home computing now, quite popular, 2002, 2003, laptops and home computers in the, in the World Wide Web and the internet comes out. 04 and 05, you know, you have Facebook coming out. You have 06 is YouTube and 07 is Twitter and 08 is Instagram. You also have in 2007 and 08, the iPhone and the smartphone coming out. 2009, 
obviously now everyone smartphone becomes ubiquitous. Uh, mobile access it starts to um, take over for internet access. And in 2012 and 2013, um, if you look here, I try to get rid of these good, there we go. You could almost see that the entire world is on fire in one regard. Um, and we thank you for watching. Or if you go back to the beginning, oh, if we can go back to the beginning here, and you see what the world looks like from here to here. You could argue that, you know, he, that our entire world is imploding. I mean, that might be one way to put it. Um, but another way to put it is that simply, um, you know, we've come face to face with an internet culture that is premised on these two findings. And uh, the, the, and this is why El Godem, who was one of the early kind of uh, anonymous um, moderators of the Arab MENA uprisings about 10 years ago now, who, who looked back reflectively in a book a few years ago, um, who talked about some of the mistakes that they thought of the internet as a liberator. And these five things, and we you don't need to go through them in, in effort to save some time is, you know, rumors spread fast online. We, this is homophily, we communicate with people that we agree with. Online discussions quickly descend into angry mobs when there's not a lot of nuance. We're forced to jump to conclusions and our digital favors our digital experiences favor broadcasting over engagement, posts over discussion, shallow commitment over deep interaction, right? Um, okay. So um, I hope everyone's following along here and um, putting out these ideas again to be, to try to be provocative. And, and um, according to my time, I've got about six minutes or so left. And uh, this is the question. So what is to be done? And when I want to come back to the beginning of my talk, um, where the research into this book and some of the work that we've been doing more recently that I want to share with you, uh, what what we have, what 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 the book argues, um, if we can pause for a second, is um, is really thinking about media literacy, reframing media literacy as a civic imperative from simply uh, an educational priority, uh, and and again. In this talk, you know, it, the, I think the, the book is, at, you could probably down, I think you can download it for free now. It's, it's been made available, but the, the text considers what it's like to reimagine media literacy through a set of values rather than simply a set of skills that we need to provide. Um, do I absolutely think we need more media literacy at all levels of education? 100%. Do I think we need more research and more formal education implementation and backgrounds? Absolutely do. Um, but what I hope we do is think about media literacy uh, with what we, we call civic intentionality. So rather than simply, here's some more resources to get us together, that we articulate, um, that we don't simply try to respond to the current moment, but that we start to think about civic norms and the, um, and the types of engagement that we need to have to have societies that are equitable and just. And to me, this comes down to um, looking at media literacy from an angle of civic intentionality and with a radical focus on, on equity and on social change and on justice um, and justice in our communities. Because otherwise you'll never solve the problems of the well-resourced having the access and having the training and the skills and you'll never solve the problem of making people smart about media without instilling with them the values they need to use media in productive ways. That assumption that you keep seeing anecdotally, that I keep seeing anecdotally, is that if more people have media literacy, we will solve problems of fake news and misinformation polarization. In our recent research that um, is co-funded with, by Namely, that Tanya was mentioning earlier, we just finished doing over 30 interviews with various stakeholders who, who anecdotally stick to that assumption with not much grounding for it and not much actual confidence in it when we talk to them. So um, this work in civic intentionality, as you can see here, signals a shift from prioritizing skills and competencies alone to prioritizing the values that support meaningful engagement in civic life with and through media. Now, I think media literacy always does this, but I'm asking for it to be intentional in this book. Um, putting a model forward that advocates for process before technology, people before products and values over skills. Um, and so how we reimagine this um, 
is that all media literacy interventions, we think, we, we what, or what I argue for, and the case studies that I ask in my book apply to this, this model, that they all are mechanisms for caring. Um, they ask what we care about and how we care for, instead of just caring about things, which is where we advocate and like and express. But how do we actually signify our caring? Critical consciousness. So what are what is our resources and our standpoint? And how do we actually build the agency to do that? That imagine alternative futures to current situations that teach us to persist, that to persistently engage in what we believe in with and through media and not simply by the values that dictate the technologies that guide our information lives. And that in and of themselves are emancipatory. They help push back against the power structures that, that continue to that continue to impose the norms within which we see the inequities exist. And in that way, um, I, I really think that what, what you'll see here is, and just to kind of um, put a little conclusion on this, is civic media literacies are values oriented. And so those reimaginations around caring and imagination, emancipation, persistence, and critical consciousness, they should, they should not be seen as replacements to the typical types of media literacy processes that we wanna see in our world, access and analysis and creation and reflection and actions. But when we do think as practitioners of media literacy, what do I want a learner to get out of this experience? Or what would I like this young person to come out with? I think we need to be thinking about the values around media literacy. And those values to me are civic, no matter what way we put towards a more just society. If we just stick with the skills and competencies, I think we could be training more people to be media literate, but we won't be solving some of the, responding to some of the issues that we see in the world today. Um, and so lastly, you know, I, I think for me, you know, if we, we in, the, in the book, we look at putting these, values of civic media literacies within this continuum of voice and participation, which is where we start and end most all of our media literacy. Who's speaking, who has access, how do we analyze it, how do we express it? And then the middle concept is agency and that these are all about building the agency. So that self and collective efficacy to feel the ability to advocate for your needs um, and for the needs of those in your community. And, and in there, I think we see, um, we see civic media literacies at their best. And this is just a, a, a few pictures of the case studies we used from around the world to talk about um, applying social and civic movements that use media um, that had very media literacy, media literate experiences in them by the traditional guide, reimagining these within the civic media literacy. Um, so there's the, the movement around uh, painting the Carocas in Brazil in the bottom left, the Harry Potter Alliance, the Standing Rock protests in um, in uh, the Dakotas, and then uh, the last one was a young woman named Mary in Scotland who uh, advocated for healthier school lunches. So, uh, and then I will close by um, uh, just coming back full circle with my last ten seconds to the project that Tanya and you'll hear about today, um, which I hope is actually able to give us. You need the research to be able to do the reforms. And we're doing this in the United States as well. Um, and in our project, Mapping Impactful Media Literacy Practice here that we've co-done with the other group, we're building off some of the ideas I've shared with you today. And we write in our mission statement, we believe that media literacies are central to a society that demands accountability from public institutions, equity for marginalized and underserved communities, and robust opportunities for people to use their voice to advocate for more inclusive futures. Media literacies do this and they do this all the time. What I argue for is that civic media literacies need to be grounded in the values that we want to guide our societies and not in simply the media practices and technologies that we see happening every day. And they need to be about equity, uh, equity in our communities because otherwise we risk having media literacy experiences that further continue to divide us in our current state. So, um, I'm going to leave it there. I really thank you. I wish uh, I could be with everybody, but um, this is my information. Thank you to Tanya and Michael and Sora and everyone again, and happy to take some questions. Thank you, Paul. That was fantastic. And I'm sorry that you couldn't see us nodding and smiling and all those <laughs> social cues you, you did. Fantastic. Can I ask Canberra and uh, Brisbane to unmute yourselves? We've got about 10 minutes. 
um, or so for questions. And I'd like to throw over first to Canberra for two questions and then Paul can respond and then we'll go to Brisbane. Um, we didn't mention at the beginning that we were going to use the hashtag media literacy 2021, but everyone's using hashtag media literacy. So we'll stick with that and take over that um, popular hashtag for the day. Um, I would like to say that we are recording the questions. You can't be seen, but you will be heard just so that people are aware of that. Um, and if you're ready, I will pass over to you in Canberra now. Hi there. Uh, my name's... Caroline Fisher, and I've got a question. Thanks, Paul. That was really fascinating. Um, can I go back almost to your first slide? And it, you had a question mark on there, a question that said, did media literacy backfire, approaching rampant uh, media cynicism? And I guess, can you talk about that question that you posed? Do you think that media literacy has backfired? Uh, well, so that that question, I think those of us in the United States would remember that um, the that was a um, a screenshot from an article that Dana Boyd, who is a prominent um, media and social media and society scholar here in the United States, she actually wrote a provocation right around 2016 17 asking that question. And while her provocation was somewhat um, polarizing in the United States media literacy community. I thought she brought up some really interesting questions about the future of media literacy. And her argument basically said that, you know, she was very big on saying that media literacy in the way that we're just prioritizing individual responsibility and we are setting it as a, as a barrier to which if we just succeed in giving people these skills, they will be fine. It's actually maybe pushing people to be more confident in their own kind of siloed realities. And that's potentially hurting the ability, you know, it's kind of building more skills without the social and civic bonds that we need. And I'm reducing quite a complex ar argument that she made. And I, I know my colleague Sherry and Michelle here would have a lot to say about it. But I do think what it asks us to do is consider, you know, media literacy, you know, a lot of people said it, it's not big enough to have backfired in the first place. But I actually think it, it, it needed a pause to say it's not simply, we keep saying just do more media literacy, where my argument was like, we can't just do more without understanding and identifying this kind of what, what the conditions are, because otherwise, you know, we see it a lot, we'll be, we'll be training people to be media literate, but we might be just training more people to use media to advocate for things that perhaps aren't beneficial for society. So that, that's where it came from. And, and I do think it's an important thing for us to consider. Second question in Canberra. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your discussion. And I think you raised some really beautiful points. And I sort of want to come at this from a young person's perspective and just sort of raise, you know, because I've seen with my peers, there are so many people who, you know, are already so disenfranchised from the media and, you know, feel the cynicism and this apathy. Um, and having this sort of mindset so early on, I'm wondering, you know, what are some, because um, you've sort of discussed, you know, it's, it's all about media literacy and it's about this education, but how do we sort of approach this and like what are the first steps um, for, for tackling this really early cynicism? Um, yeah, that's my question. <laughs> See everybody. That's a, <laughs> it'd be great to be with you. It's a, such a wonderful conversation. And the question you asked demands at least two hours of my time. So I don't know what the rest of your day is like. I will... Um, I will just say quickly, I mean, I do think the the cynicism we feel, so there's a bit of, I did some of this research before on skepticism versus cynicism. And cynicism is really just, you know, um, not having faith in the systems and then turning and walking away. And I do think at least in the United States, you know, our, our media infrastructures have become so commodified in the way that they operate that I, I also, as you know, someone who's seen this transition, believe that the, that kind of youth, younger people cynicism towards this is well funded. When you see mainstream media at all levels here in the United States, where it's a very commodified system, um, are becoming more sensational and polarized to get eyeballs more. So, you know, I often think about this as, um, you could push back against these platforms. You need to start with your local governments and your communities. And I always say, you've got to start from where you are and then move up to our young people. Is that, that you, you have to demand the type of information infrastructures you want in your own life with your own peers. 
and then build up and find the regulators and the local um, bodies and try to push that way. Because at least here in the United States, it's a, it's a very challenging um, space to be in and uh, one where we don't have a lot of regulation. But uh, I do think it has to start at, at the grassroots level and not and, and it's not simply that we can turn anything off. I, I don't believe that that's gonna, I mean, I think it would help, but I don't know. I mean, I have young children in my house and that seems to be pretty far from the truth as well. So um, sorry, I can't answer that longer, but um, it's a wonderful question. Thanks, Paul. And we'll hand over to you, Michael in Brisbane. Okay, uh, thanks, Tanya. We've got uh, Marcus Foth who's gonna ask a question. Hi, Tanya. And um, hi, Paul, that was a fascinating um, talk and Michael has just volunteered me to, to ask a question here from, from Brisbane. Um, I'm, uh, I'm really interested in the notion of, of data literacy and how it might relate to, um, to, to media literacy. It's been um, fascinating to hear that, that work and I kind of feel that it actually resonates a lot with the way that technology and um, data-driven governance approaches have um, at the same time, um, as we've seen that um, that time span from you know the um, the eighties to now um, advanced, the same advancements and developments have also occurred, um, I suppose, at that level of local governance as well as the kinds of structures. Like I'm thinking of the smart city, I'm thinking of digital twins, I'm thinking of ways that urban planning and decision making have advanced. So I'm I'm interested to hear um, from you how you see. Um, the notion of media literacy in a way also advanced to encompass not just the immediate technical and, and media and the digital literacies, but also increasingly the, the data literacies and what that then entails for the way we approach that broader topic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus, for the for the question. And I think, you know, I know, I know just also seeing the time, Tanya, I'll try I'll try to so. I think that data, so I, I actually know there's been a lot of wonderful work in here in Boston, like Catherine Dignazio. Um, has done this f fabulous work. Uh, she has a new book out called Data Feminism. And it's, and it, it's actually, and um, we've done a lot of work on data literacies here as well with trying to build tools to give young people the ability to, because the public data is there, right? And we, and there are really creative uses with it. I would still say that like part of the, part of what I've seen in Boston with smart cities is because we have so many universities, there's been a ton of work done. Um, but it, I don't think it's been radical enough to be inclusive of the marginalized and underserved communities. It's often about getting governments to work better, but, but you know, at all the meetings I've been to at our city hall and our government and with my collaborators, that question has been there, but I would argue that whether it's data or not, like you still need to have that civic will within which and that, and that framing. So I would include data literacy in this umbrella and the ability is there because there's so much public data um, in the United States, we're quite fraught with where the data goes, but um, you know, I, I, I think that's one of the, the locuses of power that there is, if you have it in that frame of, um, you know, in the frame of serving equitable purposes. Thanks, and uh, we've got Rory Elkington. Thanks, Michael, and thanks also, Paul. Um, my, my question, I guess, is about how we underline the, the, the benefits for young people of not just the media literacy, but that civic intentionality that you outlined. I mean, we know that a homophily, it's a comfortable space. It's, you know, we want to be surrounded by like-minded peers. And when you add in, I think, that really important aspect of civic intentionality to the strategies of media literacy, I'm struck by the labour aspect and the fact that Ultimately, this is more work. And, and I'm interested in your thoughts of how we underline the benefits for young people that comes from engaging and doing that work. Right, right. Well, it's a wonderful question. I really appreciate it. And I think there's, um, there's, a, there's a lot to say there because I don't, I, I, I often think about that question as like the nest, the need in those, those comfortable places and the need to have that escape and the need to have those formative experiences are important for young people. You know, our research was looking at kind of young folks that were, uh, that young kind of, that were at the precipice of doing civic participation. And, and the joy of it came from being with others and feeling connected and feeling like they were moving something. And I think that shouldn't, 
Like I, it's why I don't think you should just turn everything off because I, I, I actually think there's a lot of benefit into having that socialization and posturing. Um, and I think part of what the problem, at least with the platforms in the United States is they've done such a good job of conflating that kind of civic and the personal and that, um, that it's, 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 it's been very difficult. And the, and the labor, it's kind of, you know, I've thought a lot about this because in, in our work and with young people, you know, it's, it's almost like that, that caring element is like, it's almost tapping that inner identity, like of, of where the care is and where the imagination is. And if you do that, then you can have a wonderful intervention around advertising or around health disparities. But a lot of times as media literacy intervention, we just start with the health disparity. And then we talk about how Facebook might be bad for that. And I think that's, I, don't, I think that's where labor becomes hard, but I do think if you find a way to enact that, then you bring in the media side of it. I do think the peer support with young people is huge and that, that's what needs to motivate it. And that's where the values, I think, help overcome the simple, like we should do this because it's important, which is not very sustainable in, in young people's activism. Thank you very much for that insightful presentation. Just a question about the civic um, media literacies and the values that you spoke to. Um, in Australia, journalism is seen as a, a public good. So, you know, it's a collective responsibility, therefore, in pursuing um, media literacy and, and those values as well. So then what forces um, can assist the structures of journalism to also be champions of these values and enable um, them to move forward in our society? Uh, thanks for that question. And, and it is, um, I think one of the really kind of unique tensions in the United States at least is um, we sometimes talk about journalism as a public good, but it functions very much in the opposite way. And um, I think that might change the frame with which the question has relevance for um, for your community. But um, I would just say that there's been a lot of work and I've been doing some of this research myself lately is um, there's been a lot of work done on, on relational journalism and participatory journalism and engagement based journalism where um, they're using some of the, you know, some of these methods of how to do community engagement with the journalist side. So it's, it's bringing the community into the discussion. It's finding, it's leveraging their participation and not simply seeing them as subjects. Um, and I think that is when the public is finding ways to feel closer to the information that they're getting and journalism still sits on the outside. I think at least in the United States has been very hard that the trust has been lost there is that the journalists by the nature of how they're trained in the United States, they're not supposed to enter into these spaces because they're spaces of personal engagement. And, and we need to think about that differently. And there's some efforts done in these spaces in, in the US and what I mentioned and, there's a longer conversation to have there as well. Paul, thank you so much. You've given us a lot to think about today as we move forward with our local events. We're now going to close this streaming cross-site part of the event um, and move to our local event. Before I pass over to Michael and Sora, who are going to explain the lunch process at each site, I want to thank a few organisations who've made things possible today. Thank you to the School of Humanities and Communication Arts at Western Sydney Uni for providing me with some logistical support today. Thanks to the Digital Media Research Centre at QUT for supporting the Brisbane event and the National Film and Sound Archives of Australia, along with the News and Media Research Centre at the University of Canberra, who are supporting the Canberra event. Thanks to Namle again and to Facebook who funded this event and thanks to the newly formed Australian Media Literacy Alliance who have supported the overall planning and promotion of this event and who we're hearing from later today. Um, so thanks again for joining us. I really hope that you all meet new people today and make new connections and links that might develop and grow media literacy projects. Can we all thank our keynote speaker, Paul Mahaldas. Thank you, Paul. Thanks everybody, enjoy your day.